evening party, a very special uh, best of episode live from uh, El Rancho Manana in Richmond, Minnesota. Um, I am uh, Anthony Erick, one of your hosts, and coming up the, the hill, our other host, Ellen Stanley. Um, we are both at uh, the Bluegrass Festival, and which is why we thought it'd be a great time to, uh, to listen to uh, some of our favorite segments from the past uh, year. And uh, we um, are so excited to dive right in. We got a lot of great content. Um, we um, we uh, solicited uh, some feedback from our Patreon supporters who um, chimed in with some of their very favorite uh, episodes and stories. And uh, we're gonna just jump right into one of our very favorite. Um, this is from a, uh, a musician named Jake Blunt, one of the most entertaining um, uh, musicians to interview. He had some really great stories about the music and about his banjo. Make sure you stick around to the end of the segment to hear how he uh, got the banjo that he has, and he's gonna talk about it. It's, it's wonderful. It's Jake Blunt here on the Back Catalog Listening Party. Jake Blunt here on the Back Catalog Listening Party with Wiley Laws from his album Reparations, which we are revisiting today on the show. And we're so excited about that. And um, yeah, tell us a little bit about the tune and and where you found this tune. It comes from a A Cherokee fiddler by the name of Manco Sneed, um, who is one of my favorite fiddlers. I just really like his selections and tunes. And he has a lot that are kind of like Wiley Laws that have this kind of strange wandering melody that doesn't really fit into uh, any particular key uh, throughout the whole tune. I think it's a really interesting approach. Um, and he just sounds super cool. And he was he's he's been one of my favorites for a long time, but he's become someone that I really try to promote his work and get his message out there because I have become friends with members of his family. Um, we've gone down there, Tatiana and I, and played at the Sneed family reunion. We've presented his music at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian in the town where he lived and spoken to elders who remember him and knew him and had danced to his music growing up um, and discovered along the way that, you know, we have these these great resources that folklorists have made available to us that tell us all sorts of things about who the musicians were, the way that they lived, what their communities were like. And in Manco's case, we discovered that the information that was out there and the scholarship was not necessarily accurate. We showed up to Cherokee thinking that, you know, we'd read these articles and we had, you know, this scholarly background in, in what the stuff was. And we showed up and 
there was uh, another academic who was present at our first show in addition to a couple members of the Sneed family. And he came to us after the show and said, you can't talk about those articles again. Those are like considered borderline libelous by wow. his family. Um, and, you know, the folklorist painted this picture of Manco as this like misanthropic old cranky person who like lived far away from everybody in some shack and like the kids threw stones at his house and he, like he hit people with sticks and like it was just it was weird oh, goodness. um and basically said that manco had nobody to play with and developed this really unique style because he was playing on his own and there was nobody to hold him accountable um and the community wasn't really interested so he wasn't playing for dances and everything what we discovered upon arriving in cherokee and actually speaking to some cherokee people about it was that not only did manco play uh his brothers all played manco is one of uh, uh four brothers manco osco pico and campbell all of them played manco's daughter played she played at the grand Ole opry manco's son-in-law mm. played there were other cherokee fiddlers all around the area and were part of this tradition. And it was relatively well known how the folklorist who, who studied this didn't pick up on it. I'm not sure, but um, it was I, a I cool moment idea, but... of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool moment of, of going in there and, you know, finding a story that hadn't been told often enough uh, and being able to correct some of the narratives that persist about his music and it means a lot to his family that we're out here playing it they get excited that that it's still finding its way out there and they gifted us with some recordings that they had in the family that had not been made public um and a couple of those tunes found their way onto my next album spider tales well um i would love to know a little bit more about the banjo you're playing on this so you actually pull up the album artwork again if okay, you can, you because yep. the my album artwork is all done by my best friend from high school, and they completely accurately reproduced my banjo for this album cover. <laughs> nice. um, so, so I have the banjo it. like packed away in the closet right now. But this is exactly <laughs> what it looks like. So it's half fretless. As you can see, it has uh -huh. that a slide plate at the bottom, which means those low notes. I get that really nice slidey plunky tone. But when I want to go up high, I can actually hit accurate pitches and the notes have some sustain. Um, so it's a good compromise. It was built for me by this dude named A.D. Norcross. Um, it's quite the tale. I had to like go find he, he was like living in like a cabin that he built in the mountains outside of Asheville. And I just kind of had to um, drive out there with a friend who knew where it was because GPS didn't work. And we like pulled off the road next to some barn and hiked up the trail to this dude's cabin in the mountains. And he served us like possum tacos and like fried the shells in bear fat. It was like the most wow. elemental experience I've ever had. Uh, that's the guy you want to buy a banjo from. That's yeah. for sure. Well, it showed up to my, I, I like, he mailed, he shipped it to my college dorm and it showed up in this like battered cardboard box with banjo spray painted on the front of it like no <laughs> fragile sticker just banjo spray and it was caked in dirt like there i was like you just built this how did you get it dirty <laughs> it was just covered in dirt i had to clean it it was so weird uh wow. but i love that banjo and i do love how it came out on that record it's a really lovely instrument all oh, right, and if you uh, just tuned into the back catalog listening party, uh, we are live from the from the Minnesota Bluegrass and Old Time Music Festival, and uh, we are hosting this best of uh, show, and uh, we're doing it from the hilltop, and so it's a little exciting, and uh, there's a lot of wind, and um, yeah, it's it's actually very nice. It feels a little bit like fall, but we're not going to complain about that. Um, so uh, we are going to talk with Lily Lewis from episode 102. It aired on March 25th, 2022, and uh, out from yonder, and she talks about uh, making this a cappella record. So we're going to go to that uh, next, I think. Right, Tony? Here it is. Lily Lewis on the back catalog listening. Um, from a technical perspective, do you have like a looping pedal? Do you have like a piece of software where you're where you're kind of going over and over? What's your process? So you're already, you already know what's up ahead of you. So I did end up getting a looping pedal for one, maybe one or two tracks that are on the, um, like halfway through the album process. I did end up ordering a looping pedal. But uh, in this particular case, 
anything that sounds looped sounds looped is actually played through like i you know so you'll hear all these anomalies and like rhythmic like uh, that's not quite right well, that's because i'm playing it through and i don't know how it goes oh. yet and i and i didn't try to quantize anything and try you know like i didn't fix anything you know it's just kind of how it came out so i actually had a pair of drumsticks with me on the on the mountain and i like i started with the rhythm and then the seed all happened seed all seed all you know and i was like so i followed that and then i layered that and then but before i really finished layering that i was like well that's the idea then i started trying to figure out what the melody was going to be and i just started singing and i didn't know that it was going to change keys and i didn't know like mm -hmm. you know and i had no and so i would go section by section and oh it changed keys okay great and then i would dress that up with some stuff underneath and it was just sort of like again a tuesday a tuesday i think i started at a like 10 o'clock in the morning after my morning tea, you know. <laughs> I, wish, I wish my Tuesdays were like that. <laughs> um, I think I, I, I kind of heart this title because, um, like, what's a lady woman? I don't know. But, like, I think, <laughs> I think it, it just sort of reflects, like, where my head was at the time. It's just, like, I, I didn't need things to make sense in those days, you know. I feel like these days I try to communicate a little more directly. Whereas back then, you know, I allowed myself to be as metaphorical as I needed to be because I was really um, trying to get my feet on the ground. Like so many people witnessed to me that I was like a head without a body, you know, like that I was all like all thoughts and all philosophy and all, but like the visceral experience of being human hadn't quite landed on me yet, even in my twenties and, you know, and, um, and so a lot of the poetry that showed up in these early records is like me trying to like create my own um, mythology so that I could free myself up to be a human and, and use these mythologies as a reference point. Um, and so that's essentially what this track is. It's a, it's my uh, manifesto. Um, and it might be more meta more metaphorical to others than it is for me, but I, I kind of feel every line very literally. All right. Well, let's give it a listen. This is Lily Lewis Mountain Lady Woman here on the Back Catalog Listening Party. Cries as I 
Mountain Lady Woman here on the Back Catalog listening party from her 2008 release, Out From Yonder. And uh, wow, I don't think I, usually we do a lot of head bopping and dancing <laughs> during music on the show, but I have to say, I think this was the most, um, uh, for an acapella tune, usually that's like a full band kind of situation where we're like full body dancing. And I feel like um, <laughs> this might be a first for an acapella tune to get that much grooving. <laughs> It sounded like a full band to me. Yeah. <laughs> Holy moly. Lily Lewis here on the back catalog listening party. And, and like she says, live like life. Man, <laughs> that sounded so good. Um, and it's so great to, re to revisit that track. All of that being done just with the human voice is really, really amazing and uh, really inspiring. Um, welcome back to the back catalog listening party. This is the best of volume three. Um, we're coming at you live from uh, El Rancho Manana in Richmond, Minnesota. Um, and uh, we uh, are so excited to revisit these segments from this past year. And Lily Lewis, um, that I encourage everybody to go back and watch that entire episode. It's episode 102 from March of 2022. You can find that at backcataloglisteningparty.com. Um, I honestly recut this segment about four or five times because the, the software we use wouldn't allow me to, to um, upload anything more than 10 minutes. And uh, I, there was so much good stuff in that episode that I wanted to keep in there and I couldn't get it all in. So I highly encourage you to, to go back and, and listen to that because it's a real special one. Um, and speaking of special episodes, back in April, um, we had Sarah Harmer on, on the program. 
This is episode 105. And she um, was talking about this experience she had recording this album as a way to bring more awareness to uh, a problem that was happening with the Niagara Escarpment. Um, it's like this out, this rock, rocky outcropping um, up in the kind of the northeast region of, of the U.S. and um, Canada. And her band and her decided to take matters in their own hands to uh, to preserve this wonderful natural feature. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll let her tell you about it. But it was so cool. It's another way that musicians are doing are doing the good work out there. And uh, you'll you'll see what I mean when you when you uh, hear her story and her song. This is Sarah Harmer, Escarpment Blues. Here on the back catalog listening for it. Anyway, so I was sitting at home, middle of winter, thinking about how to protect Mount Nemo, which is one of the outliers on the escarpment. And um, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to like have this the hobo stick, you know, with the bag, <laughs> your, like a few belongings and do a walking tour. Um, and so you like walk from gig to gig. That was the idea. We we walked every every like we didn't walk continually from gig to gig, but we walked sections between every gig. And then we had a van. We had we used biodiesel. We had like these jugs. <laughs> of it was pretty. It was really fun. We we camped. We we stayed with friends. Um, we did stuff like we did went rock climbing. I had a friend who was just like I'll organize all these like events. So we went rock climbing. We did went kayaking. Um, and then, yeah, we played, I think, about seven shows in community halls and theaters along the way. And we called it the I Love the Escarpment Tour. And uh, this next song, I'm excited that you you chose this one because this is actually one that you did do um, when I saw you in Minneapolis recently. And um, Escarpment Blues. And obviously we were talking about the escarpment at the top of the show. But um, is there anything else you want to say about this song? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, Gravel mining is still wreaking havoc on the escarpment. We, we won this fight to protect Mount Nemo in 2012. We went through a huge hearing for 15 months and listened to all the experts and cross-examination and all this. And, and the province dismissed uh, Lafarge Wholesome's uh, proposal. And then in 2019, so the ink was barely dry on their no decision, they, they came back and said, oh, we want to try again. Uh. And uh, so they're, they've mounted another um, application to try to blast and scalp the top of Mount Nemo. So we started a coalition, a whole bunch of community groups in Ontario. So we've got um, a new uh, coalition called the Reform Gravel Mining Coalition. So you can go to reformgravelmining.ca and learn all about how the gravel mining industry is out of control in Ontario and um, why precious source water and species forests and wetlands are at risk and and how we need to manage the industry better and so i wrote this song to kind of encapsulate the the tale of what was going on uh yeah on mount nemo and and nemo means nobody in latin and i always like that i think it, it, it really belongs to nobody which means i think it belongs to everybody so it's a unesco world biosphere reserve like it's it's internationally recognized for its its ecological importance so escarpment blues still still a blues song but hopefully i won't have to keep singing it <laughs> that's our hope as well um give it a let's give it a listen right now this is sarah harmer escarpment blues here on the back catalog listening party if they blow a hole in my backyard everyone is gonna run away Creeks won't flow to the great lake below. Will the water in the well still be okay? If they blow a hole in the backbone, the one that runs across the muscles of the land, oh, we might get a load of stone for the road, but I don't know how much longer we can stand.
Escarpment Blues, one of the better protest songs in my book. Sarah Harmer from her 2005 album, I'm a Mountain, which we are revisiting today on the back catalog listening party. I am back and uh, uh, live here from the Minnesota Bluegrass and Old Time Music Festival in Richmond, Minnesota. And um, I, after after a potty emergency with my three-year-old, I'm back. And um, I, I'm so glad I got back in time to hear that clip though with, with Sarah Harmer, because that was one of my favorite episodes. I've been a fan of hers for a long time, but um, all the conversation about how they made that record. And I did, actually didn't know that about the album until we really dug into it, even though I've been I own that album and I've been listening to it for years and I knew that she'd been doing advocacy about the escarpment, but I didn't know that that whole album, the way she made it and the way they, um, you know, actually did a walking tour of the escarpment before uh-huh. recording it. It was so cool. And, uh, Thanks again for uh, joining us here on the back catalog. And thanks to Lily Lewis again for joining in live in the comments. If you guys have comments, feel free to share them here. And, uh, and I just want to officially cheers you. Uh, and thank you for joining cheers. us. Um, and, uh, again, the reason, uh, we wanted to share these clips is these are some of, uh, some of our and your favorite episodes. And also, um, again, we are live from the festival. So we knew we wouldn't really have the capacity to do, a uh, as you can tell tech wise to do a, 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 a traditional <laughs> show, but we're having a lot of fun and I hope you are enjoying revisiting these episodes. If you want to check them out in their full glory, and with maybe slightly better high fidelity, you can do that by going to backcataloglisteningparty.com. We've archived all of our shows there, so you can check them out. Um, maybe it'll be a reminder, or if you missed some of these episodes. So I think uh, next we have queued up uh, Tim O'Brien, right? Yes, right? and that was our big episode 100. Yeah. I've been a huge fan of, uh, of Tim for so many years, and um, just to, to be able to chat with him about one of my favorite albums, The Crossing, um, which uh, I believe came out in 1999. I, it's, it's just a, a very influential album for me. And what's really cool is that um, the album itself is all about the crossroads, you know, of um, bluegrass and, and Celtic music. And the, the clip that, that uh, we chose for, for our best of is him talking about his journey to Ireland and uh, kind of trying to find his roots and uh, maybe wondering if it was such a great idea uh, in the end. Um, it's a really cool kind of talking blues um, style song um, that he wrote about his own experience called Talkin' Cabin by Tim O'Brien here in the back catalog listening party. This song is kind of a reaction. This is more like um, uh, Irish American going back to Ireland, you know, maybe being going there for the first time and kind of wondering what it's all about and uh, a little confusing, you know, what it's all about. And, uh, you know, some of this stuff actually did happen to me in this song. You know, I did see a Molly O'Brien's bar and I, you know, I, the first time there, I didn't understand 
you know, what get you know, that much about Guinness. And then there's the thing about the hardware store. Uh, I actually did find the place where my great grandfather would would have grown up in County Cabin. The County Cabin is kind of off the tourist trail. It's not on the coast, and it's uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, but it's uh, it's just there's a stereotype about cabin people that they're tight with their money, uh, <laughs> and um, and they're kind of they're kind of suspicious of someone that they don't know. So I'm in this town where my great grandfather came from. I started asking around and people were kind of afraid of me. You know, I have this funny accent and uh, <laughs> some people just wouldn't talk to me. And uh, but I finally found the place where my great grandfather was from. And uh, I met a guy who had inherited the place that day. But then year, uh, about a year later, I was trying to we were trying to locate some relatives and I never did find any. But a year later, uh, I was leaving Ireland and I saw in the Irish Times, a national newspaper, that there was a case of meningitis. A young girl had died and she was from, she worked in Baileyborough uh, County Cabin. And that's only about 10 miles from Kingscourt in the direction that uh, where my great grandfather's place was. And her employer was a guy named Lawrence O'Brien. And uh, he was the, he owned a grocery store there. O'Brien super value. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I just thought, well, this is an O'Brien. That's the same name of, as the last guy who owned the, the, the farm there. So I just thought maybe there's a relative, uh, you know, a, a, a relation there. So I, I wrote to O'Brien super value in, in Baileyboro County Cabin, you know, and I said, you know, I'm looking for relatives, you know, you don't have to answer me, but uh, if you, if you know anything, let me know. Uh, I'm a musician blah, blah, blah. I gave him a little life story, you know, a little synopsis of what I do. So about two months go by. And one day about, about four o'clock in the afternoon, I get this call. Of course, it's 10 o'clock in Ireland and it's Lawrence O'Brien. He said, uh, and he was kind of, you know, he had a few drinks and he said, you know, I'm not related to you, but I might know somebody who is. And then he said, uh, you know, if you, when you come back, I'll show you the sites. And then he chuckled because there aren't really any sites. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did, you know, uh, I did go back and, and visit him and stayed at his house. And I've stayed in touch with him. And uh, oh, nice. he's a real he's a real down home guy from from County Cabin who's become quite well to do because because he had one of the first supermarkets. And it's just like a big business. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's just a funny thing like and, and you know, and also this song, I was in a, um, I was in a shuttle bus getting a rental car in Albany, New York, and uh, the guy, the driving guy driving, had an Irish accent, and I said, "Are you from like Cork?" He said, "No, I'm from Kerry, but close. I'm from the border." I said, "I thought your accent was familiar." And then he asked me what I, what I was about, what I do, and I said, "Oh, I'm a musician." He goes, "Oh, you're the guy from Cabin," because <laughs> he had heard the. He had heard the song on the radio. <laughs> oh, no and, way. Uh, and uh, it's, it's such a funny thing. People, you know, in Ireland, they it's a small place. And he had only recently moved to New York. Wow. <laughs> wow. What a great so, story. So this song is, uh, you know, big hit in Cavan, uh, County Cavan, uh, Ireland. But uh, we're going to enjoy it now in the Back Catalog Listening Party on this 100th episode. Um, this is Tim O'Brien. Now a while ago I chanced to roam to the place my great granddaddy called home. There wasn't much I saw that day, but I learned a whole lot more along the way. I was going to Ireland, retracing my family footsteps, digging up roots. You could call them tubers. Now the closer to the root of my family tree, more people seem to look like me. I saw a sign said Molly O'Brien's bar. I knew right then I couldn't be all that far. So I went in there and I asked for beer and he pours out this black stuff. He says, cheers, Guinness gives you strength, he said. And I'll tell you friends, it's like drinking bread. There's a loaf in every pint. I started feeling strong. I felt like I could sing. Now my 
dress was wet, my tongue was loose when the barman asked me how'd I choose to travel such a long, long way on such a cold and a rainy day. I said I'm going up to Kingscourt Town, that's in County Cavan, just to look around. My great granddaddy came from there, and I want to see if the old home place is still there. Well, he shook his head up and down, and then side to side, and then he turned around and he said, A Cavan man then. You know, a lot of people wouldn't admit to that. Well, I figured I'd save myself a little bit of hassle, booked a room nearby in a fancy castle. I had a hard time getting my dinner there. It was full of these people with light blonde hair. Danish tourists. Two big busloads of them. Now the owner of the place, his hair was black, and when I talked to him, I didn't get much back. His people are what you'd call West Brits. They're the ones that treated my people like dirt. That led indirectly to the Irish Civil War. I didn't realize I'd come back for just a little bit more. That fella's nose was way up in the air, but he took my money just the same. Now that night I dreamed I saw the ghost of the one I'd rather have as host. It was Tom O'Brien walking around the cabin west of Kingscourt Town and County Cabin. And then the very next day in a hardware store, I met a cousin ten times removed or more. But he was no apparition, he weren't no haint, he was selling nuts and bolts and paint. And I told him about our family connection, and he kind of stood there still reflecting. And I could tell he wasn't much impressed. When he asked me with nary a trace of jest, he said, How exactly may I help you, sir? Just bought some nails and got the hell out of there. Then later that day, after some detecting, I found the lane in the rural section and it matched the picture in my dad's scrapbook and my heart beat faster as I drove up to look. And then the sun burst through the clouds just then. As I gazed down at the current residence, it was a little sheep dog and an old milk cow. I guess the old home place is an old barn now. It's ashes to ashes, dust to dust, thatched roof to tin roof, and tin roof to rust. All right, Tim O'Brien yeah. with Talking Cabin. I'm so glad. And that was uh, our hundredth episode with Tim O'Brien, who is definitely a bucket list artist for both Anthony and me. And if you just tuned to Back Catalog Listening Party, we are coming to you live from the Minnesota Bluegrass and Old Time Music Festival in Richmond, Minnesota. It's a bit of a windy day, but uh, beautiful out here. And we're happy to be here live hosting this Best of Back Catalog Volume 3. And um, and looks like, oh, Stan's joining us too. Um, and uh, we are happy to be here. And uh, looking back at that episode, Tony, I was reminded uh, that not only how, how great that story was that set up for that Talking Cabin song, uh, but the other part that was so great is that we are wearing fancy clothes because we celebrated our 100th episode, uh, which was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, so. and that's thanks to, thanks to you folks out there. We want to, you know, once again, thank uh, especially our Patreon supporters for getting us this far. Um, it really uh, makes a huge difference for us. And, you know, just looking back and celebrating uh, 100 episodes is, uh, is pretty amazing. So thanks again for, uh, for being here. So um, another kind of bucket list guest for me personally, um, as a banjo player um, and a fan of, of really good writing on the banjo, especially, um, we had uh, Allison Brown on the program. And for those of you who are not familiar with Allison Brown, um, she is a world-class um, banjo player, like hands down one of the best, one of my favorites in the whole wide world. Um, but she's also a business owner. She owns Compass Records, uh, an amazing Roots label um, that is, uh, you know, putting out some of the best acoustic music. Um, I believe she's got a degree from Harvard. She, she's just, just an amazing human being. And I've been a huge fan of hers for so long. 
and we had her on the program back in January. Um, I think it was our first episode back uh, uh, after the break in 2022 and episode 92. And something that I hadn't thought about as much until we talked about it was her experience as a female playing bluegrass banjo back in the 70s and 80s and, and even now. And what, a, you know, you know what, what kind of trail she had to blaze herself. Um, she doesn't say it like that, but I mean, listening the way she's talking and stuff, uh, it's it's a it's really a, it's really a, an important perspective, and it's one that I'm so glad that she discussed on this episode, because um, you know it's people like her that are bring you know bringing the next generation of, of female bluegrass artists um, into the genre, and we're so grateful. Uh, so I wanted to highlight uh, a segment where she talks about that, and then also talks about um, her. Uh, um, her banjo number. Allison, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. I mean, when you were coming up playing bluegrass, uh, again, you had some wonderful people who took you under their wing so you could tour like with Stuart and um, play with people like Vince Gill. Um, but tell us a little bit about like how, um, yeah, how, how that felt like being a, a young person you know, being in this other world of, of, of music where there weren't a lot of you know female peers. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, on some level, I think that that's a pretty universal experience for women of a certain age, whether it was in bluegrass music or investment banking or the law <laughs> or my pretty much just about anything. Um, and, you know, I, I got to, I, at a point when I was a teenager, I felt like most of my friends were middle aged men because that's who I played with. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just there weren't a lot of role models for female banjo players. In fact, I'm not sure really if there were any. I mean, there was a woman named Lauren Seepy who played with the band called Lost Highway. But like in terms of women, like on the national stage, like really driving the direction of the music, there wasn't anybody like that. And so as a result, there was a lot of, you know, you sure do pick good for a girl kind of comments, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which, you know, was true because there was no one else doing it. So there was really no point of comparison, I guess, for people. So it wasn't necessarily mean spirited or anything. It was just kind of the way it was. Um, and it's great to see that change. You know, Missy Rains and I talk about that a lot because we're contemporaries and she grew up in West Virginia. So she was playing the East Coast festivals and hearing the sh you should be pick good for a girl stuff a lot too. But it's, it's, things have definitely changed. But at the same time, I've got this, you know, occasional project band called the First Ladies of Bluegrass, which came about when I realized that we finally, finally, after 25 years of IBMA giving out Instrumentalist of the Year awards had five women who won Instrumentalist of the Year awards on all of the main five bluegrass instruments. <clears throat> Yay. So <laughs> including a former, was... a former guest of ours, uh, Becky Bullard. Yeah. Oh, right. Of course. That's right. Becky. So, you know, I mean, really like it really took that long for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on, on most of the instruments, there's still just one. So, and we mm -hmm. still don't have a Dobro player of the year. So there's, there's work yet to do, but I think having, um, you know, musicians that you could look up to that you can kind of see yourself in is really, really helpful in, you know, in bringing more women into the music. And I've heard Missy say that. And so it's like, if you can go, if you want, are a young woman and you want to play mandolin, you see Sierra Hall is like, okay, I see Sierra. So I can imagine myself doing that. But if you're just looking up there and all the banjo players are these big hairy legged men, you're just like, well, I really want to play banjo, but <laughs> I don't look like those guys. It's just, it's a lot harder. But then the other thing I think too is we're getting enough women kind of at the upper echelons of the business. And, and I think it's, it's exciting because we now have enough women that can create opportunities for other women who are coming up. I think that's really an important part of the equation. You know, it's now like you don't have to wait for some guys to do it. Let's do it for ourselves. And speaking of, of banjos and females playing the banjo, I mean, Girls Breakdown. When you put a title like that together, right? Girls Breakdown, it's representing. <laughs> and yeah. it certainly does. And I'd love to hear um, a little bit about the background of the song before we listen to it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was learning to play, my favorite Earl Scruggs tune is Earl's Breakdown. And, and Earl's Breakdown, it's like, uh, I don't have my banjo, I wish I did, but, you know, Earl would tune, use his tuners 
to set the pitch on the second string so it could be two different pitches and kind of make that rare, rare mm. sound mm. with it. And that was like the hook of that tune. It was my favorite tune. So I wrote this tune, Girls Breakdown, using tuners also and just wanted to kind of riff on the idea of Earl's Breakdown. So that's why I called it Girls Breakdown. I really wasn't trying to make like a broader statement. <laughs> I was really, it was more of a tip of the hat to Earl Scruggs, who well, celebrated his birthday yesterday. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Earl, yeah, yeah, happy birthday, Earl. And, and well, it I, I think the first time, maybe one of the first times that I heard this song, a local uh, banjo player, Peggy Olson, here in the Twin Cities mm-hmm. was playing it on the stage of this little pizza oh. place in Minneapolis. And Delano's. It, it made, oh. yeah, so it made a difference. And, uh, and I, I loved hearing Peggy do it. And I can't wait for everybody to hear it. This is Allison Brown, Girls Breakdown, here on the Back Catalog Listening Party. <laughs> Alison Brown here on the Vet Catalog Listening Party with Girls Breakdown uh, from her 2000 so album good. Fair Weather, which we are revisiting today with Alison Brown joining us from Nashville. Let's see here. Uh oh. <laughs> wow, anything can happen on a live uh, a live show, including not having a segment. <laughs> um, 
we do not have that segment queued up. Um, so it looks like we're going to move um, on to uh, another segment. We're going to take a listen to Raina Del Cid, um, a wonderful artist who has roots here in Minnesota, but is really an international figure now, um, playing all over uh, the world. I think she's living out on the West Coast, um, but just a really wonderful musician and songwriter. And uh, we, we had her on and she's got this enormous YouTube following. And it was such a fun episode for Ellen and I, because, you know, um, there was suddenly thousands of people watching live when we uh, went on. Um, and uh, she, she had some great stories. Also recommend going and checking out that episode. But this, this next tune um, had a few cool features. Um, it's a really cool um, song about, you know, the death cap mushroom, which is kind of an interesting topic right there. Um, but also she had some behind the scenes footage of, uh, of Tony, the, her guitar player, actually playing the solo that is featured in the song live at Pachyderm Studios um, in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. And anyways, it was a really cool segment. We really wanted to include it in this episode. So let's take a listen. This is Raina Del Cid, Death Cap, here on the Back Catalog Listening Party. The last song we're going to feature today is Death Cap, which Carol's going to be excited about. Um, so tell us a little bit about this song and why you wanted to make sure to include it on today's show. So this is the song about the mushroom, Death Cap. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a killer mushroom called, uh, I think it's Amanita's, uh, I'm going to make a fool out of myself, Amanita's Fallow, Fallow IDs or something like that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, it's an extremely, it's the most uh, poisonous mushroom known to man. So uh, it's very common in Europe. I was reading about it in, a, in an article in National Geographic one day, and I thought it would make a really interesting sort of concept for a song. Uh, so I, I wrote this. We did the music video for it in Iceland, which was a really cool experience. First time I'd ever left the country and I was really afraid to get on. The, I hate flying. So I was afraid of the international flight and uh, was really glad I did it anyway because we had an incredible shoot and, and got a really cool video out of it. So, yeah. So those who are watching on YouTube here, you'll see a picture of you. This must this is filming the video. Yep. That's Jason Ho. He's the director. And it's then gorgeous. Me, Tony was along for the ride, even though she wasn't in the video. She was kind of you know, helping, like, it was so cold when we were filming that, and she, Tony kept running out with, like, jackets and with hand warmers and stuff, so happy to have you there. But. Well, speaking of Tony, um, just because I know we're getting short on time, but I love the little nuggets um, that we can share on this show that you can't really find anywhere else. Um, for this song, there's a really killer guitar solo that Tony does, and um, somebody in Pachyderm had the camera rolling and shared uh, Tony just tearing it up on the solo. Would you mind if we share that? Let's see it. Before, all right, so you can hear, you, this is gonna be the solo isolated, then we'll hear the song. Um, so this is Tony um, playing her solo. <laughs> the whole thing just so you know folks so yeah that was just a taste but i love oh. i love it i mean you get to see was that the actual take then do you know if that was the take that, that was uh, the and... take. yeah that was exactly the take so oh that's Ooh, even yeah. cooler yeah Very all cool. right well let's give uh the let's give the whole song a listen this is death cap reina del cid here on the back catalog listening party the baddest news of all it comes in mid-july Standing in my summer dress I've got tears in my eyes The telephone's ringing But I don't want to go Down to the river To the river where the death cap goes So can I stay? Please can I stay Just one more day Just one more day well, I've been a fool From London to Rome And just picking mushrooms On my way back
right time. All right. <laughs> Forgot about that last bass note. Raina Del Cid with Death Cab here on the Back Catalog Listening Party from her 2015 release, The Cooling, about the Deathly Mushroom. And... Oh, man. That was so cool. It was so cool, so cool to watch the, the solo in, you know, being recorded and then get to hear it and kind of you can imagine what was going in uh, on that. So, um, Ladies and gentlemen who are watching live, first, we're going to just say thank you so much for being here. Um, just knowing that you were here, um, you know, you know, Connie, thank you. It was a fun show um, <laughs> um, in between um, these little minor crises, crises. We're duct taping this together, folks. <laughs> but uh, but it was so much fun. Um, but yes, thank you for putting that banner up there. Um, we want to, you know, assuming it's, it's mostly our Patreon supporters that are out there, we want to give you a very, very special shout out. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's why we attempted this, right, Ellen? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to thank you all for for being here and uh, and <laughs> your patience with us. But again, uh, you, when you, when you go see this episode later, and we'll probably upload it to YouTube too, um, yeah, you'll see will. the full, you'll see all the clips. And you'll see it in more high fidelity than you're getting right now. So mainly, just yes. thank you for spending your Friday with us and and getting a little remote vision of what we're what we're doing here. And the rest of the time, we'll be picking and hanging out. And uh, if you're here at the festival, make sure to come say hi to us because we're uh, I'm around for the rest of the weekend as is Stan. And I think yeah. Tony might have another gig he has to run off to. Yeah, but uh, we got to run off to another one. But um, but yeah, this year was fun. And so a big 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 special shout out to uh, all of our patreon supporters um let me get the full list up here so in all it's okay. penny Hello? and alinda bevan connie vaughn alan chris I'm alex becky galen Ted, joe jim beverly <laughs> john fred tim sarah david jocelyn court matt steve mark homestead pick and parlor severin lynn craig jake mary many tracks nikki Thank you guys so much um, for uh, being a part of this community. Um, I mean, we have enough episodes to have a, the third volume of a, of a best of with, you know, some of the biggest names in Roots music, Tim O'Brien and Allison Brown, Lily Lewis. I mean, this is, this is like such a dream for us and you guys make it possible. So thank you so much for, for supporting the show. And uh, yes, we'll see you next week here. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week on the back catalog. Keep picking. Bye, guys. Bye.